Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we're talking about why we should keep some land wild and the important work of land trusts with special guests, Rika Ayat, Executive Director of the Deschutes Land Trust in Oregon, Jeff Danter, Senior Vice President of Field Programs at the Trust for Public Land, and Liz McLaren, President and CEO of the Land Trust for Tennessee. So thank you all for joining us. It's great to see you from all over the country. And we're going to be talking about about, uh, something that is near and dear to your hearts, why we should uh, protect land and why it is in our personal interest to do so. We have all experienced, and and in, in my corner of the world here in California, fires, floods, Erosion, drought, storm surges, there, there's depopulation of treasured species. Uh, we are eating microplastics when we eat fish. Um, so let's talk about the uh, actions that we can take now to keep our ecosystems healthy and ensure that uh, America, as we develop, is developed in a way that preserves what is so uh, so important to us all. So talk about the Deschutes Land Trust, Rika. Why? Why do we have a interest? Why do I have an interest not living in Oregon of of having um, your land trust um, preserve land in Oregon? It's a great question, Mark. And um, fire obviously is um, prevalent here in our area too. In fact, um, I've just been in this job for nine months and on day seven of my job as executive director, a fire came onto one of our preserves. And so, that's sort of how I got my start in the land trust world. To answer your question about, you know, why folks who don't live here in, um, you know, the Deschutes Basin ought to care about the work that we're doing. And I think that to your point earlier that our work um, in climate change mitigation, I mean, we're working locally, but with a global impact. And so our focus is really on trying to conserve lands that support our climate change mitigation goals. We specifically prioritize habitat diversity, for example. Um, and we have, a um, in some places like in our Deschutes Basin, we have some really unique opportunities to capitalize on some areas um, that, that can actually make a difference. Um, we've still got some relatively untouched areas here that um, are remain privately owned and that we're working to conserve. So when you look at these, at these uh, places, and if you look at the Deschutes area, which is famous for its uh, salmon uh, birthplaces, um, it's it, if you eat salmon, you're going to care about those areas that allow salmon to to continue to live. If you care about fires, you're going to care about how we cultivate our wildlands to preserve uh, our atmosphere um, as as carbon sinks. Jeff, uh, could you talk a little bit about the scope of the programs because you have a different uh, scope, don't you? The Trust for Public Land works in wild areas, but it also tries to preserve urban areas that that uh, um, uh, that require green spaces. So, so talk about the scope of your work. Yeah, thanks, Mark. So the Trust for Public Land is a, is a national organization um, working on the ground from, from Maine to Hawaii. Um, and we are a, a land for people organization. Our, our, our mission is around how we practice conservation in a way that benefits people. And, you know, one of the things that the, that the evidence is really growing on is the importance of parks, open space, and wildlands. Um, for physical and mental health, people um, who recreate outside are much healthier. Um, it's really through, uh, through the pandemic, we've, we've, we've seen a lot of evidence of that, of people have flocked to the outdoors in their local parks districts. Um, climate resilience and climate mitigation, as Rika said, um, you know, well-managed forests, well-managed glass, uh, grasslands are, are incredibly important in the climate space. Um, community vita- vitality, social cohesion are things that are outcomes of the kind of conservation work that we're talking about today. Even economic health um, is tied to the health of, uh, health of the landscape. Um, but, you know, from the urban core to remote wilderness, um, people lack the places to go to be able to get outside and to get the benefits of of natural places. Um, the Trust for Public Lands has estimated that 100 million people, including 28 million children, don't have close to home access to the outdoors. 
Um, and we're losing 6,000 acres a day to, to commercial development. That's 6,000 acres of, of wilderness, 6,000 acres of farms, 6,000 acres of front country places to go and recreate. So it's, um, uh, it's critical infrastructure in this country, natural lands, agricultural lands, and, and yet not invested in as, as one would hope for other kinds of uh, infrastructure. Are we preserving lands for the privileged? Uh, because if we if we um, move lands out of use and those lands are going to be visited uh, only by the people who can afford it, is that really what is going on here? I would say that that is a legitimate argument across the history of the conservation movement in the United States. But I think increasingly we're we're doing a better job. But it's true. Um uh, uh, parks in, in low income areas, um, are a quarter the size of parks in high income areas and they serve, um, four times as many people. Um, and so there is an inequitable distribution of parks and open space across the country and an inequitable distribution of parks and open space funding across the country. But I think the conservation movement has, has embraced that challenge and is, and is working hard to, um, uh, to change that narrative. Liz, uh, what, is, what is your answer to that? Because Tennessee is one of the most stunningly beautiful states, and you're, you're working on trying to preserve land, but you're also trying to preserve land for people. Uh, could you talk a little bit about, about your take on, on this issue of, of who are we preserving land for? Sure, um, and thank you for having me on. I appreciate this. Um, you know, I think the, the Land Trust for Tennessee recognizes that we recognize that our work is perpetual. Our work is we're promising to be around forever and um, preserving land now while we have the chance. Of course, the equity lens is a part of what of, it's one of the many lenses that we use um, in our in our conservation planning. But we recognize that down the road, everyone will benefit from the work that we do because we're promising that that work will be around forever. And, um, you know, it isn't, we also recognize that it isn't just stepping foot on land that gives you a sense of peace. Um, of course, that's important. And we work on both public and private conservation. But, you know, you can enjoy a beautiful drive. So you're behind, you're, you're, you're riding a bike or you're behind the, a windshield or whatever. I mean, there is, we say that our work is hidden in plain sight. You don't know necessarily that what you're looking at will be preserved forever, but we know it will be. And it will be that view in perpetuity because of our work. Liz, is it important that we, we change the mix of investment, um, that we include programs, programming and we include education and we include um, uh, sort of engagement. One of the things that, that, that I've always felt about the environmental movement, the conservation movement, the land trust movement, is that we don't do enough programming. We don't, do, you know, Jeff talked about, we're about people, right? We're about land, you know, doing our work for people. Uh, sometimes it feels like the land trust movement forgets about that is it time for a, a assessment about how we involve everyone in our work and give everyone a stake? How do, how do you look at this in Tennessee? Absolutely. Um, it is something we are taking very seriously. Um, we're, I'm sitting here on 64 acres in the middle of Nashville um, at Glenlovin Farm, which is our primary community engagement site. We have kids from um, schools, private and public schools, um, Title I schools come out for field study programs. We are, um, I think we sent 1,500 STEAM education kits out to schools across the state last year and this year. Um, that, and and the, the response from all of that has been incredible. Our, um, we have a community engagement manager who um, has just been doing incredible work. She did a series, if, if you go to our website, landtrustn.org, um, you can see it at Glenlovin Farm, you can see a, a virtual hikes that we took kids on um, and, and a bunch of other topics covered in those videos. Um, she also did, um, she did some virtual field, field trips, steam field trips out here 
And I think she engaged 2,500 sixth graders. Um, and so you've got, you've got that piece of it, but we're also doing a master plan for Glen Levin Farm that will um, take in, into account the ecology, the history, and, the, and our mission and will it around evolve, this place. Yeah, will it involve uh, all those people you talked about, kids and people from all walks of life and so on and so forth? Rita, Absolutely. Are you, are you also thinking on those terms? Are you, are you thinking in the same terms that Liz is? I mean, totally different parts of the country, right? Yeah. Well, we acquired recently our first ever um, semi-urban preserve right outside of Prineville. Um, saying Prineville and urban in the same sentence is a little um, incongruous. It's a very rural area, but we're um, extremely close to the community. Our property is actually right across the river from a community park that is um, has a lot of public use. And so we have been working very closely with the community to develop a site that includes um, a a sort of a new resource for walking access, but also have built our walking access um, in connectivity to the uh, county's master plan for more uh, walkable and bikeable access to different areas of the town. So um, we've actually also gotten a ton of support from the health community, um, the local health councils in our work in developing these walking paths as a way to get um, the community out and moving and connected with nature and accessing those health benefits. And so we certainly see the value. I think we, along with all the other land trusts, are at the beginning of a very long journey of doing a better job of engaging communities that um, we've traditionally missed. But I think we're, um, you know, in partnership and trying to support each other, taking steps in the right direction. I'd like to, uh, to take on um, an issue that is very often raised, which is the, uh, the dynamic tension between different interests, in particular jobs, economic development, and so on and so forth, and uh, preservation, conservation. Jeff, when you, when you look at uh, respondents, even in a, in a group that is um, as self-selected as this one is, right, the people who attend uh, this kind of a discussion are going to be very interested in conservation and land trust. But two thirds of the people said that, you know, preserving land is absolutely top priority. Uh, one third, uh, even in this select group, said that, you know, jobs, um, employment, economic development um, uh, often need to trump uh, that. So, how do you see mixing it up with, with that? Because we can't have a situation where economic development is, is uh, always placed on the back burner, nor should it always be in the front burner. How do you adjudicate that at the Trust for Public Lands? You know, I, I feel that in some sense, it's a false choice to argue that you can have one thing or the other, that you can have either economic development or conservation, or you can have good schools or conservation. Um, affordable housing is often pitched against conservation in a competition for, for funding. We have done a lot of economic studies that show that investments in parks and open space yield anywhere from four to 11 times return on that investment in terms of an impact on the local economy. Um, the Outdoor Industries Association, um, you know, has dramatic, dramatic statistics on the employment that's generated out of outdoor recreation. So there is a way to build um, solutions that meet both those community needs, the economic needs, and the, the conservation needs. So I'm not going to let, say, I'm not gonna let you off the hook with that. So let me talk about <laughs> mining, mining, extracting which, minerals, mining. Sure. Right? Because if you look at, at, at uh, wild lands, whether in Tennessee, which has a, a pretty considerable mining industry or around the country, and we're talking about right now uh, shutting off the Russian market, which provides minerals, um, and there are all sorts of different uh, issues uh, surrounding uh, uh, self-sufficiency. Mining is very often the practices associated with mining pollute. There are trade-offs, right? Uh, is this really about the question of, of socializing uh, the damage that comes from economic activity um, or not socializing it? You know, it, it seems to, it seems that that we we constantly duck the fact that in order to to coexist with economic development, whether it's harvesting trees or mining or, or other kinds of extraction, that we duck the real issue, which is what we're actually demanding is that industry increase costs in order to preserve 
the quality of the environment? You know, I, in my experience, um, uh, and, and let me let me start from from this point. I, increasingly, the Trust for Public Land hires community organizers as opposed to ecologists to to guide our work because we are completely entrenched in in the community. And in and in my experience, if you talk to the community as opposed to talking to the to the people who who position themselves as spokespeople for the community, you'll find that there's a lot of agreement in what. Uh, people want the community and the landscape around the community to to look like. Um, and so um, people in the community are concerned about jobs and they are concerned about pollution and they are concerned about their opportunities to get outdoors and they are concerned about what the landscape around them looks like. And, you know, there isn't a one size fits all that says that uh, um, a limestone quarry in the Southern Cumberland lives one of my favorite places on earth. Um, and, um, and, you know, a gold mine in New Mexico, that there's one solution that fits all of those. But oftentimes working with the community, you will find that you can come to a consensus around how that economic versus um, landscape uh, decision making is going to happen. But it takes a lot of work. Um, uh, as, as a national organization, the Trust for Public Land has to be very careful not to parachute in with the solution. The solution has to come up from the from the local community, and it involves all of the local partners, whether it's the local land trust, the local arts organization, um, you know, the local food bank are all important players, along with the mayor, the governor, and the owner of the mining company. What a concept, Jeff. Confidence in democracy with a small D, right? I mean, D, right. <laughs> and the CNs, right? Liz, I, you're not, there's not just one opinion here. Tennesseans know what is, and, and you, you kind of have to listen to just folks, right? Just people on the ground. Absolutely. Um, a couple of years ago, we did a conservation plan. And part of that conservation plan, it was a conservation plan for our organization. Um, but part of that conservation plan was actually, um, a, we, did a, we did a statewide survey and we had so many interesting comments um, about what was important to Tennesseans and to people who visit Tennessee. We had, we had. Oh, Liz, Liz just uh, cut off. I'm not sure exactly what happened. We'll see whether she can uh, get back on. But I think she was saying that it starts, as you were saying, Jeff, it starts with with the people and not necessarily just assigning um, uh, uh, voice to the most influential, the nonprofit leaders or the business leaders or the government leaders, but but just uh, just people. Um, Rika, do you go out and, and do you solicit uh, opinion so that you can shape your programs in ways that that serve the people who are living on the land and and uh, who are around Oregon. Yeah, we do. Um, we have a forthcoming. We actually um, have a a big potential acquisition um, coming up in the near future, and we're undertaking now what we're calling our stakeholder engagement and visioning process. So when we're setting out to acquire. Um, a large preserve, that's sort of um, key to how we do that process is to get together um, and really talk to the community about what the needs are. I wanted to go back to your question, I think, to talk about kind of how that balance works in conservation with practices that are sort of considered extractive versus maybe recreation, which is maybe a less extractive economic outcome. And I think that one thing a lot of people don't know about a land trust is our um, work with um, in partnership with agriculture and working lands. So that's something that we're really working hard on here in the Deschutes Basin is to partner with ranchers and farmers. And you know these are economic drivers in many of these communities. Um, and you know, leave the land in production, but work with them to find ways to do it more sustainably. Um, and I think that as we sort of, we can buy the land that's available to buy out there, but there's a lot of land that's gonna remain in these, these economic production situations. And so we're trying to find ways to partner with those folks um, and to come to an agreement that we all wanna see, um, you know, we all wanna see water available in perpetuity for these practices. We all want to have healthy food sources for our communities. And so how do we work together to do that sustainably? And I think we've had a lot of success there. And I think that there's a lot more to be had around the country and some really good stories. 
I think I, I think that's this is really important. One of the things that is that is so important about this is that land trusts really are comprised of deal makers. That's the nature of a land trust, right? What you're basically uh, agreeing to is land gets contributed or gets gets purchased, but um, there is a whole network of of agreements that are created surrounding these these efforts, um, right? So um, uh, we're gonna we're gonna go back to Liz when when she's back on on audio, and Liz, you're on mute right now. Um, but Jeff, could you just talk a little bit, uh, if you if you could uh, describe shortly, what kind of agreements do you uh, develop on the run up? Let's say let's say either I'm a landowner or I'm an influencer of land that is unprotected, and there is an interest in protecting that land. This is a this is a multi year, sometimes a decades long discussion as to how. You know, in the sense that 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 Rika um, described, how different interests surrounding that land uh, can be addressed. How does that work? Do you, or do you have a bunch of attorneys, and you working with other attorneys? Are you are you developing? Um, are you bringing scientists in? You you already said that you solicit uh, opinions from citizens and from different interests. Um, how does that unfold? Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, Rika is absolutely right um, about the, using the the sort of land trust and land conservation tools to protect different interests within the community. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's a legal deal making uh, aspect to all of this, which is tremendously exciting for Liz, Rika, and I, but maybe isn't so exciting for most most people. But the, the question, the, the fundamental issue is how you determine what values you're seeking to protect in the conservation work. Um, at the Talks for Public Land, we have a, a really cutting edge research and development, research and innovation team that uses really sophisticated uh, machine learning and mapping tools um, to, to guide our work. And what, we, what we've been creating lately are these decision support tools that we share with our land trust partners and our uh, government partners. And a big part of that is, is providing a lot of data um, that then different interests can rank so that everybody gets an understanding of what the priorities are within a landscape or a community. And Liz, do so, you for instance, also do this kind of a thing that Jeff was describing where, where you, you're basically creating some sort of a matrix that then can become a basis for further discussions amongst the different parties, as Jeff described? Right. Yes. Um, we definitely, you know, we we created, as I started to say, a, a conservation plan um, in, in 2019. And um, we sort of we, we call the, the layers of the map um, baklava because it's literally like all of these layers. And we weighted each layer differently, um, you know, from historic to prime agricultural soils to uh, uh, climate resiliency for um, forests. Um, to then that that um, that we received through our surveys, and then on top of that, the threat layer. So population growth um, is another layer that we used. And again, you know, it, Tennessee is unique. Um, we have three grand divisions um, and three very different cultures. And so, getting that statewide um, that statewide input through our survey was really important um, when we were when we were undertaking this. And now that is you know, our, our roadmap, so to speak, um, for conservation for the next, for the next number of years. Um, and we're, we were the first land trust in the country to do a statewide conservation plan like that. So, um, we, we use all of those tools. And when we, when we were working on a conservation project or considering working on a conservation pro project, you know, we definitely, um, have a ranking for that. Um, and sometimes we say not now, and sometimes we jump up and down. We're so excited about it. And, and Jeff, I'm sorry to cut you off. Um, uh, you're, you're as, as, as one of the big dogs in conservation, uh, your methods are also shared with others uh, like Liz, uh, like Rika and, and others throughout the nation. So you're creating these ideas as ideas and then interactively with, with partners throughout the nation with counterparts and so on, you're you're constantly improving those methods and ensuring that they get disseminated if if they seem to have impact as well. 
Yeah, that's exactly right, Mark. You know, the the conservation field is an ecosystem, right, with with all kinds of players in it. And for that ecosystem to be healthy, um, uh, all of those players need to be well resourced and integrated together, and each and each playing, um, you know, their specific their specific role. Uh, the Trust for Public Land has created created more than 400 local land trusts. We have a real interest in making sure that those land trusts are all thriving and, and doing what they do because it's different than, than what we do. And they bring a, a local or, in this case, a statewide um, you know, perspective to the work that we you often have if we have an office there, but sometimes we, we don't have. Um, and making sure that everything that we do is accessible to everybody else is really a critical component of that. You know, the conservation field is just like every other field in the 21st century. It's a knowledge industry. And that, that knowledge and tools and sophistication is what makes this whole ecosystem run. That and money. It, well, it's, it's one of the things, this, this idea, there, there are several things I really admire about how the Trust for Public Land has always operated. One, the idea of creating balance, and making sure that you're financially strong while you're pursuing your mission. That's always been at the center. Um, and then also this idea of spinning off, spinning off. Basically, your eye is on the prize of the mission. And you're not wedded to a particular model or becoming bigger or becoming more, quote, powerful. Um, and that is part of why you are powerful, because you you do decentralize to the extent that you can and make sure that there is influence at the local level. Rika, we're, we're reaching the end of our time. I'm going to give you and then Liz the last words. What? How should we change our way of thinking and our way of, of, of uh, acting? Um, we just completed two polls. One was what we asked what the biggest benefits to having open public lands are. And the two areas that came out were uh, biodiversity, sustainability, uh, you know, a good, good, healthy uh, natural ecosystem. And the other associated with that is human, re human use, uh, education, recreation, uh, relaxation. Uh, those, those seem to be uh, primary. And, and how do we change to ensure that America, from an environmental uh, standpoint, is healthier. Uh, Rika, you're on mute. Um, uh, tell us what you think I should do tomorrow to yeah, be I a better it. steward of the lands. It's just about relationship building in our communities. And I think looking at our conservation movement and, and private landowners, um, and communities not it, not at odds with one another, but in partnership. We we ultimately all have the same goals. We all live on this planet. We all enjoy its natural beauty, especially here in Oregon. It's such a key part of why we love where we live. And so everybody's invested in keeping it um, keeping it this way and, and being able to pass on that enjoyment to our kids and grandkids. And so instead of I think um, sort of squaring off against one another, um, you know communities who don't want to see change and land trusts who want to conserve lands. I think that partnership and working together and finding where we share vision and, and share values. And we've, we found it here in Oregon and we're, you know, we can, we continue to look for it. Um, and I think that's the key really is, is those relationships and, and finding where we, where we both believe in the same outcomes. And Liz, um, same question to you, how should I change tomorrow? How should I change how I think tomorrow? in order to help your work? Well, I mean, I, you know, obviously you could make a gift to the land trust of your choice. I'm sure you do anyway. Um, I think there of what we're losing and really looking at that and in each community, um, you know, across the state of Tennessee, but across the nation, you know, having having an eye on what's important um, in your community and the character of a community. Um, you know, Tennessee is, is known for country and we're losing it. Um, and so really just being aware and becoming actively involved in your community related to conserving land and conserving community character. I think if we can all just take a breath and appreciate that fact that we can take a breath that it's clean air 
uh, if we can t uh, take a sip of water and, and appreciate that it is clean water, if we can be in a place that is natural and, and understand that not everyone can do that, and then try to do what you say, Liz, do what you say, Jeff, do what you say, uh, Rika, and, and try to advance the preservation in a way right. that benefits everyone, uh, that's, that's the next act that I can take tomorrow. Rika Ayat, Executive Director of the Deschutes Land Trust in Oregon, Jeff Danter, Senior Vice President of Field Programs at the Trust for Public Land, and Liz McLaurin, President and CEO of the Land Trust for Tennessee. Please thank, please thank your staffs, your board, your donors, your volunteers, uh, your communities for the work that they do. And, and thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for having me, Mark. Have a great day. Take care.